title of the message this morning, The Victory That Has Overcome the World. The Victory That Has Overcome the World. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you for the opportunity we have each and every Sunday to open your word and to, to study it, to walk through it, and to allow you to speak to us. Lord, we believe that your word is the clearest way in which we can know your will. And Lord, that's what we want to know. We don't want to know our what our ideas are or what we may think. Lord, we want to know your will. And so we know that as we go to your word, Lord, you will reveal yourself to us and you'll give us direction for our life. And Lord, I pray that you would do that in each and every life here today. And I pray this morning that you would help me to open my mouth, to preach your word, and to exalt Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So Robert Mao was a senior in high school in Illinois. He played on a soccer team, Robert Mao. This was a story from the early 2000s, and it made national news, and former President George W. Bush wrote a letter to Robert Mao because of what unfolded during a soccer match. It's Robert Mao's senior season, and they're playing his team. High school team is playing one of the top five teams in the whole state of, of in, in Illinois. And it's a difficult match. And so Robert's team is very, very nervous about the game, but they realize that they can compete and they're doing well and they're competing. And, and it's coming down to the last few seconds of the match and they're down by one goal. And Robert gets a breakaway and he has an open Open, an opening to the, to the goal. And as time is expiring, Robert shoots the ball, kicks the ball, and the ball goes into the net, and they score, and the crowd goes wild because nobody thought that they were going to be able to compete with this team, and they tied the game, and everyone is shouting. But it's not just shouts of celebration. There's the opposing team that is saying that the goal was kicked after time expired. And so they're protesting, the opposing team and the opposing team fans are protesting with the referees that the goal was too late. It was too late. He kicked it too late. And so so Robert saw what was going on and he saw the controversy that was unfolding. And he goes to one of the referees and he asks him a question. He says, sir, is the time that is official, is the time that is official, is it on your stopwatch or is, is it the clock on the scoreboard? And the official informed him that it was the clock on the scoreboard that was the official time. So Robert informed the referee that he noticed that the clock had gone to zeros before he kicked the ball. And so as a result, he would have to say that the the goal did not count. And so the officials overturned that ruling based upon what Robert admitted, and it ended in, in a tie. And the team ended up losing in penalty kicks. And so after the game, everyone wanted to talk to Robert, we wanted to talk to him about why did he do that and why would you, why would you stand up and say that the officials had, had, had ruled that, it, that you got off the kick in time. And this is what Robert said after he was interviewed. He said this, every time in your life you have an opportunity to do right, you should be thankful. For a person to know what right is and then not to do it, that would be a sin. To have won the game, Robert said, I mean, really, who cares? Doing the right thing is more important. Isn't amazing? Yeah. President George W. Bush heard about that in the news and made the news and wrote Robert a letter to commend him for his character, for doing the right thing. And so Rob and his team, they lost the game that day. They lost that soccer match. But in reality, Rob won a much bigger victory, did he not? But the truth is this about Rob. Actually, Rob was demonstrating, by what he demonstrated on the outside in his character, Rob was demonstrating that he was already a victor before he even kicked that last shot. He was already a victor. Before he even walked onto the field for that soccer match, he was already a victor because he was a believer. 
Didn't matter what was going to happen in that match. And certainly he was running around and sweating and he was trying his best with the athletic ability that God had given him to compete, to win the match. But in reality, in the grand scheme of things, he was already an overcomer. He was already a victor. And in our text today, in 1 John 5, as, as we're wrapping up, we have two more messages in 1 John. So we're wrapping up this series as we walk through this epistle. John is now turning his attention to this reality that in the believer's life, we are already overcomers. We are already victors. We have won the battle. We've won the battle. We have overcome. And we're going to ask the question, what does it mean that we're overcomers? What does it mean that we're overcomers? We're in the battle, just like Robert Mao was in that battle, that match, but he was a victor in the middle of the battle. What does that mean in our life that we are overcomers, that believers are victorious, that it is who we are? What does that mean? I think our text will show us some of that here today. Let's look at 1 John 5. Would you read with me 1 John 5, verses 1 through 5? It says, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. By this, we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? So John is beginning to wind down this letter, and it has been a letter that has highlighted who is a believer and who is not. It is a letter of assurance for genuine believers that they can know that they belong to God. And it is a letter also that would, re- would reveal that if somebody is deceived about their condition, their true spiritual condition, that their eyes could be opened to recognize that they're not a believer. It is a letter of assurance, but it is also a letter that could confront someone who believes they're a Christian, but they're really not. And if you noticed throughout this whole series, as we've gone through the first 14 weeks of this series, if you, we could summarize it down to one main argument that John is making that would distinguish between somebody who is a Christian and someone who is not. It is centered around the question of obedience to the Word of God. Does someone obey the Word of God? Would you not agree? We, we, we have lots of different arguments about do you love your brother in Christ? If you don't love your brother in Christ and you hate your brother in Christ, you, the, the truth of God is not in you. you, you know, so there's different arguments. That if, if you say you have no sin, you're a liar, the truth is not in you. And there's different arguments that John has been making. But I think we can all agree that really it's summarized around the idea of obedience to the Word of God. Is somebody obeying the Word of God? And if they are not obeying the Word of God, It's probably pretty strong evidence that they're not a believer, but if they are obeying the Word of God, that's what believers do, right? Verse 3 serves as the culminating reality. Look look back at verse 3. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. His commandments are not burdensome. You've heard it said, haven't you, in the world today? about Christianity. It's just a bunch of rules. All they want to do is control your life. And and if I follow Christ and I got to obey the rules and I'm not going to have fun, you've heard those sentiments, haven't you? But what does John say about the Christian? We love to obey his word and his commandments are not burdensome. And this is John's argument about a genuine believer. It is the joy of the heart of a believer to obey the Lord because we love God's word. Do you love God's word? Do you love his commandments? His commandments are not burdensome to us. It is the joy of our heart because we know that God's ways are the best ways. God's ways are the best. His word is the best. His word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. 
John is expressing this. He, and, then, and then he leans in to describing the objective truth about the believer who takes joy in the word of God. So he establishes there in verse 3 that, that for those who are believers, they don't see the commands of God as a burden. It's not a burden to obey God. And then, as what we're going to look at in our text, he leans in and says, okay, here's an objective truth about those people, about those believers. For everyone who's been born of God, who, who doesn't see the, the word of God as a burden, the commands of God as a burden, everyone who's been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that's overcome the world. Our faith, who is it that overcomes the world? The one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Believers are overcomers. Believers are victorious. To overcome, to be an overcomer, that's the term to describe a Christian. John says that that's who we are. So what does that mean? This is what we're going to look at. What does that mean? John doesn't necessarily go into a lot of the details. He describes the reality, the objective reality that Christians are overcomers, So we're going to look at the Word of God in some other places as well to look at two realities that are true of every believer, two areas that every believer is victorious over. We're going to look at what it means that we are overcomers. Notice first, believers are victorious over Satan and his lies. Believers are victorious over Satan and his lies. Did you see it in in verse 4? For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the... World, everyone born of God. What does it mean to be born of God? To be born of God. This means everyone who is no longer a child of Satan. You know, if we studied earlier in First John, John just, he, he would, he'd ramp up the intensity of his argument. He eventually got to the point where he was just basically saying pretty straightforward, not basically very straightforward, you're either a child of God or you're a child of the devil. And this is the language he's using again. Everyone who is born of God overcomes the world. Born of God. This is not speaking uh, that we came from God the same way that we came from our parents. To be born of God, what did Jesus tell Nicodemus? You must be born again. Born again. Being a new creation, this is the language of the gospel. Being a new creation, to be born again. Jeremiah 31, the prophet Jeremiah talked about the new covenant that was to come through the Messiah, through Christ, and that, and that the old heart of stone would be taken out of man. When we talked about, when we read earlier in Ephesians 2, that we were dead in our trespasses and sins, that is reflective of a stony heart, a, a hard heart that through the gospel We are made a new creation because our old spiritual heart is taken out and we are given a new heart, a new heart to be born again. We are born of God. Everyone born of God does what? What does the text there say? They overcome. What does that mean, to overcome? It literally means to be victorious over, to be a victor. To be a victor, to be victorious. Those who have a new heart, who have been born again, who are new creations in Christ, it's not that you will overcome, it's that you are an overcomer. You are a victor. When you become a Christian, at that moment, you have entered into a decisive victory. You have become a victor. You become a victor. This is what John is saying here, everyone born of God overcomes. Now listen, it's not the idea that we become a victor. It's that we are a victor. Not a victor over what? Everyone born of God, new creations, are victors. Victors over what? What what does it say there? Over the world. Everyone who's born of God, everyone born of God overcomes the the world. Well, what, what, what does that mean? What, what do, what's the world that we overcome? Is John saying that Christians overcome the world in some kind of world conquest? Well, the church is going to militarily, we're going to overcome the world, and all the world around us, we're going to take over by force. Is that the argument here? No, I, I, th- I think you guys know that. It's not, that's, that's not the, the argument. No, the word world used here describes the system of practices and standards associated with secular society, or said like this, Satan's worldwide system of deception and wickedness. We, when we are born again, we become victors over Satan's worldwide system of deception and wickedness. Isn't that good news? 
We become victors over Satan and his lies. This is the first reality that is true of every believer, every person born of God. You immediately become a victor over Satan and his lies. Immediately. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says this about those who are not victors over Satan and his lies. It says, in their case, those who are not born of God, the God, who is Satan, of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. Satan is the false God, the God of this secular, atheistic, wicked world system that stands against God and his word. And there are people all around us that are blinded to the gospel of Jesus Christ because these, the un, because unbelievers are defeated. They're living as if they are victorious, but they are actually defeated. They're defeated. They're blinded. They are victims of Satan and his lies. They are believing false ideologies that are opposed to biblical truth and morality. When you see false ideologies that are opposed to biblical truth and morality, where does that come from? It comes from Satan. It doesn't come from man. It comes from Satan. He's a liar. He's the one that motivates false ideologies and truths that are, and, 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 and messages that oppose biblical truth. Listen, I'll say it plain. Any message or idea that promotes what opposes Christ and what is revealed in Scripture as right and true is satanically motivated. How do we know that? How do we know that? Because the first attack in the garden against Adam and Eve was against what? God's word. Against God's word. Did God really say? So I want you to think about this just for a moment. So as we consider how pervasive the lies are in our world, may we not just assume those, these lies are just because people are crazy. Let's think about that for a moment, because that's what you say, and I say. Oh, look at these crazy people, crazy people. No, people are deceived into delusional thinking. The lies are satanically motivated. Second Corinthians 4, 4, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers. They, they are living as they should live if they would be blinded and deceived. How do you think you would live if you, were, if you were blind? You think you'd stumble around, knock into a few walls, knock some things over, look a little crazy, look like you're drunk? Right? And here, here's another thing to consider. In the world in which we live, when it comes to spiritual realities, there is no such thing as neutrality. No such thing as neutral. Like, you're either with God or you're opposed to God. There's nothing neutral. Well, that's just a good person, right? That's just a good person. They may not be a Christian, but they're a good person. There are no good people in God's kingdom. They're only forgiven people or unforgiven people. That's it. There's nothing neutral. Now, now, now notice what John says at this point. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. John is saying that the believer, Christians, their eyes are open. They can see who Satan is. They see his tactics. They see his schemes. They, 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 they have won victory over the, the worldly system of antichrist thinking. The Christian has overcome the evil one. 1 John 4, 4 says it, little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. And here's the truth. It's not that we've won the victory. We haven't won the victory. Christ won the victory. We share in the victory of Christ over Satan and his power. We overcome. We are overcomers. We are victors because Christ is the victor, and he overcame. He overcame. Paul, in a, a prayer that he prays, I love, don't, don't you love the Apostle Paul's prayers in his letters? I love his prayers. One of them in Colossians 1, he's praying for the believers in Colossae. 
Colossians 1, he says this, I'm praying that you would be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son. We have been delivered as believers here today. We've been delivered from the territory, from the domain of darkness. As believers, we're no longer under the control or the pull of the enemy as we used to be. We were, we're no longer dead in our trespasses and sins in which we once walked according to the, the passions of our flesh. But our eyes are opened. We can see through the lies. Can you see? Can you see through the lies? We have the truth. Because we have what? We have his word because we have Christ. We have the truth because we have Christ because we have the word. And his truth is a, a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. It is dark in our world today. It is dark in our world. And there are many deceptions and lies that are out there. And his word is a lamp to our feet. It shines the light of truth in front of us so we know how to walk and where to walk and where not to go and, and what to do. And his word guides us through the darkness of this culture. Because the, the lies are everywhere. The deception is everywhere. And we don't have to be deceived anymore by the lies of Satan. And it's easy to be deceived by the lies of Satan. He's slick. He's slick. You know what the enemy does? The enemy works to make what is obviously sin look normal. The enemy works really hard to take what is obviously sinful and make it look normal. In the USA Today article last week, USA Today article last week, the title of it was this, Your Polyamory Questions Answered. Why is polyamory so popular? That's the subtitle. Polyamory. Your polyamory questions answered. Some of you are like, I have some questions. What is polyamory? <laughs> polyamory. Break down the word poly, many, amory, love. Polyamory, many loves. Or the technical term, according to those who are into polyamory, bilateral, consensual, non-monogamy. Need, need some interpretation? It means you're married and you want to have relations with other people that aren't your spouse. That's what it means. Article is so interesting. You know, back to what I said, the enemy likes to take what is obviously sinful and make it appear normal. So the article is written by a clinical psychologist. And she is addressing why she believes polyamory is now being normalized in society. She says that societal norms are shifting. You think? Here's another thing she said. It's a part of pop culture. This is so interesting what she says here. There are more balanced views depicted in movies and TV shows. More balanced views of adultery and fornication depicted in movies and TV shows. Here's another thing she said. People are more willing to share their true desires. <laughs> I'm just, I, it's sad, but I just laugh when I think about it. Like going to your spouse and saying, let me share my true desires here with you. And what's interesting is she, she, she leaned into this part of the article, and she says that people are more willing to share their true desires, which then creates community and a safe space to share. And then she ended with this, therapists are more aware of it. And she talked about mental health conversations around those who are Stuffing down their polyamory, polyamorous desires. Wow. What is this? This is the sin of adultery and fornication packaged in a way to appear normal. That's the enemy's tactic. And there are those in our culture that have been married for years and they're tempted to go that route. It's, it's the idea that we should obey our urges. 
and that our urges, our base level urges are normal and it's okay. And so we want to create community groups so we can gather together and, 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 and normalize our urges. This is the lie of the enemy. Fornication and adultery has always been sin and it will always be sin. Sexual relations are designed to only take place in the covenant of marriage. One man with one woman for life. And so the enemy comes and he lies and he twists. And this is, this is who Satan is. But we are victorious over his lies. We, our eyes are open. We have come into the light. So listen, here's what I want us to think about. Listen, as Christians, we're overcomers. We, we, we are not lost in this deception because the light of the gospel has come in our heart because our spiritual eyes have been opened. So what is a call for us? As Christians today, when we think about Satan's lies and his deceptions, you think about how subtle this idea of fornication and adultery, let's just call it something different. It's polyamory, right? Let's just call it something different to, to, to sanitize it. What is the call for us as Christians today when we think about the deception of the enemy? Here's the call. Do not bend your convictions to accommodate satanic deception. We cannot bend our convictions to, to, to accommodate satanic deception. And the pressure for individual believers and for churches is to compromise biblical convictions over areas of sin that are increasing in our culture in every passing year. The culture is seeking to normalize, obviously, sinful behavior. And why must the church and believers not accommodate? Why? Why? Why must we not? Because everyone who is born of God overcomes the world. That's why. We don't accommodate because we've, we've overcome that. We, we can see it for what it is. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How can we who have died to sin live any longer in it? How can we who have died to sin bless sin in any way, shape, or form, or accommodate or twist scriptures to line up with what Satan is doing in our world? No. We cannot fall for his new slick strategies to deceive. We must stay sharp. So, what does it mean that Christians have overcome the world, that believers are overcomers? It means that believers have overcome Satan and his lies. Notice next, believers are victorious over the sting of death. We have overcome Satan and his lies, and we're also, we are victorious over the sting of death. Look back to the text, for everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is the victory that has overcome the world. What is the victory that has overcome the world? John says, this is the victory. What is the victory? Or said a little different, what is it that causes the victory over the world? What is it that causes the victory over Satan and his lies? What is it? He said it there, right? He said, our faith. Our faith is the victory that cause that, that, that we are victorious over the world. It's, it's our faith. John is saying it's our faith. So is he saying that victory over the evil world system comes through us having strong faith and through believing hard enough? Is that what he's saying? Well, because I have strong faith. It is, this is a victory that overcomes the world. Our faith! That's what I grew up thinking. I just got to have really strong faith. I'm going to overcome the world. This is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. And so I gotta, I gotta, just gotta really work really hard to have a lot of faith so I can overcome the world. No, it's not what he's saying. The word faith there is describing objective truth. This is the victory that overcomes the world. Our faith, our faith in what? Our faith in Jesus Christ. Our faith in that we believe that Jesus is the Son of God. The word faith in verse 4 is connected with what is said in verse 5. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? So here's what it means. The faith that overcomes is the faith that believes that Jesus is the Son of God. 
That's the faith that overcomes the world. Because if you get that right, if you get that right, if your spiritual eyes are open and you see Christ for who he is, it is that faith that opens your eyes immediately to the deceptions that you couldn't see before. It's faith in Jesus Christ. It's an objective faith about the truth concerning Jesus. Jesus defeated death, and because of our faith in his work, we too will have victory over death. We too will have victory because of our faith in what he did. We, we, will have, we have victory over Satan and his lies, and because, and here's the pivot here, because of his defeat of death, as we read in 1 Corinthians 15 earlier, we too will have victory over death. So for the believer, not only are we victorious over Satan and his lies, but we are victorious over death. Death no longer is our greatest fear. Death's no longer our greatest fear. Our hope is found somewhere else. I love what 1 Thessalonians 4 says, don't be uninformed. Brothers, we don't want you to be uninformed about those who fall asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. Falling asleep is a way to describe death. Brothers, don't be uninformed about those who've died, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. The idea is fallen asleep in Christ. Those who have died in Christ. We don't grieve like others do who have no hope for eternal life. When a brother and a sister in Christ die in Christ, we don't have to grieve as others do because we know where they are. Believers do not grieve like those who do not know the hope that is in Christ, the blessed hope, not wishful thinking, but calm assurance. And that calm assurance is founded upon what? What did Paul say there? The resurrection of Jesus Christ. The resurrection of Jesus, the blessed hope of Jesus far exceeds any worldly thing that can only offer temporary distraction and false satisfaction. The blessed hope of Jesus far exceeds any worldly thing that can only offer temporary distraction and false satisfaction. Because Christ is raised, we will be raised, and death no longer is our greatest fear. Paul said of the resurrection of Jesus in 1 Corinthians 15, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. What's Paul saying there? He's saying Christ died for our sins, he was buried, he was raised, it was attested, and the tomb is still empty. The tomb is still empty. And therefore, and therefore, I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is, that, that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where's your victory? Oh, death, where's your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We are victorious over Satan and his lies, and we are victorious and overcome the sting of death. Because Christ has been raised, then death is no longer the final enemy, the greatest enemy in our life. Death is our victory. And what does he say in verse 58? Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord because the sting of death has been defeated.
I want to, I want to say this at this point. That we walk through a lot of trials in our life. And we walk through a lot of grief in our life. And we struggle with how broken this world is. And the Apostle Paul talks about that. He talks about how the outer man is wasting away. The outer man is wasting away. And we see, we see that in our physical bodies and how we're not getting stronger as we get older. We're getting weaker. And we, we work out as we get older to try to minimize the, the downward trajectory, right? And we feel that we feel the effects of the curse of sin that we all will die. We have an appointment. We talked about it last week, right? We have an appointment with death, a time. And, and we feel all of that weight. And, and I love what the Apostle Paul says here in 2 Corinthians 4. He says, so we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away. Amen? <laughs> I'm not against slowing it. It's good. Do CrossFit. Work out. But our inner self is being renewed day by day for this light, momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. And this is the difference between a believer and a non-believer. We see the wasting away, and we know death is coming, but we have a blessed hope. We know that if this body is gone tomorrow, that what is true of us spiritually is what is the truest reality. And that they can kill the body, but they can't kill the soul. They can kill this outer body. They can take my life and take my breath. I, I can be gone tomorrow, but who I am will be with the Lord forever because of my faith in Jesus Christ. But the truth is, is that this generation does not know how to handle the wasting away of the outer self because we're too busy distracting ourselves. That's how they handle the wasting away of this outer life and the death that is to come. This evil world system is obsessed with distracting people from the reality of death. Stay busy distracting ourselves from thinking about the, mor the mortality of life. And this generation is all the more anxious because of it. This generation is all the more anxious because of the wasting away of our outer man and their imminent death that is coming. They're all the more anxious. In his book, The Anxious Generation, Jonathan Haidt explains that the generation being raised now and those at the peak of Gen Z, the peak of Gen Z would be those born in 1995, so 28 years old and younger, are being overwhelmed with anxiety because of the influence of the smartphone. So he wrote a book, The Anxious Generation. He did a study since 2010, what he would call the beginning of the smartphone era. So the iPhone came out in 2007. So he's taking a few years of data, data forward. 2010 to 2018, from ages 10 to 25, anxiety diagnosed from secular people, secular Doctors, these are the statistics. From 2010 to 2018, from ages 10 to 25, there's a 134% increase in anxiety, 106% increase in depression, 72% increase in diagnosed ADHD, 102% increase in, ana in anorexia, 33% increase in substance abuse and addiction the age of distraction from life, the smartphone age, the smartphone age of distracting ourselves from the wasting away of our outer, of our outer self, the distraction of, of the reality that death is coming our way. So this, this smartphone, and the smartphone companies have created the apps and the phones to be addictive. They've designed it to be that way. And so as a result, we are the anxious generation. It's not just Gen Z, it's Gen everybody. Hate says it 
in his book, it's H-A-I-D-T, I don't know if I'm saying his name right, he says it in his book like this, quote, there, are, there, there has also been a spiritual degradation that is happening to all of us, including adults from our phone-based lives. This generation, young and old, is distracting itself from the existential realities of this life, meaning that life is temporary. Why am I here? Where did I come from? What are the answers to evil? What about death? What's going to happen? Then you have school shootings that happen regularly. Kids have to carry extra heavy burdens of anxiety on them, and they're not processing it properly, and they're just absorbed into a social media cell phone world. And so we distract ourselves. We do it through sports. We do it through social media. We do it through politics. I mean, you know, there is some good news that I see. There's been a surge of social media influencers and media celebrities who are waking up to the futility of these things. I, th- I think you probably see it too. People are waking up to the emptiness that is offered in the ancient lies of the evil one. So everything, everything really does come full circle, doesn't it? No matter how sophisticated we become in our modern age, we cannot escape the old battle. People are either deceived by the evil one like Adam and Eve, deceived by him and his lies, or they are overcomers who share in Christ's victory, who defeated Satan and sin and death. And in, and in truth, we are living in a culture today that is fighting tooth and nail for victory on all kinds of different issues. Are they not? They're fighting tooth and nail for lots of different victories. And much like Robert Mao's high school soccer match, the players on both sides are competing and fighting to win. There's a lot of movement, lots of action, lots of effort. Right in the middle of that match is Robert Mao. Right in the middle of that match is a believer. And it's almost like Robert is playing a different match altogether. Certainly he's playing to help his team win. He's sweating and he's running and he's giving effort, but at the same time, Robert is competing from a position of having already won. And this is what is true of us today. The culture is fighting for all the things that they have been deceived about. They're fighting for their positions and their policies and all the things they've been deceived about. And here we are in the middle, like Robert Mao, in the middle of that soccer match. And we're in a position of having already won. We have overcome Satan and his lies. We have overcome the fear of death. A loss for Robert in an earthly match does not change the greatest reality in his life. In in essence, Robert cannot lose, and neither can we. My brothers and sisters, this is the Christian life. We are overcomers. The world system all around us, motivated by Satan, is scrambling and fighting to somehow find victory for their cause. And here we stand, unmoved, unflinching, trusting in our Lord, living out our faith for Him. No matter how dark it gets, we cannot lose. Why? Because He has already won. Because He's already won. Amen.